Council will stand in session. Roll call, please. I'm not here asking you to stop growth. A member of my family was killed with a gun. It can happen, and it does, and it was an accident. We need to vote against these fares and cutting services. I passes five to two. A lot can happen in a day. We'll make sure you don't miss a thing. to a very unusual Tacoma Park Election Forum. My name is Eric Bond. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Tacoma Voice. I'm joined by Bill Brown, who is the Managing Editor of The Voice, Tacoma.com, in case you were wondering. Every two years, residents of Tacoma Park elect its City Council and Mayor. This year's election is unusual because there is only one contested race which is in Ward 4, the seat currently occupied by Terry Siemens. He is challenged by Eric Mendoza. Eric Mendoza cannot be here tonight, so this forum fails to meet the minimal standards of a debate. Given those circumstances, uh, we're approaching tonight's forum as a discussion of the state of the city now and the city of the future. Um, and uh, we will, it will be much more informal because uh, none of the uh, 
council members or mayor on the podium or on the, on the dais are actually competing with each other for seats. Um, we're going to start tonight by hearing from Terry Siemens, however. Uh, he will be, um, oh, before we do that, let's go across the, um, the dais and uh, could each of you uh, uh, introduce yourselves and tell us which ward you're from? Sure. It's Kay Daniels Cohen. I'm from uh, representing Ward 3, uh, Ward 3 Rocks. Uh, and that's, the, that's it. That's enough. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> we both live in Ward 3, so. Yeah, I know. We agree. I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the mayor, so I could say Wards 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Jared Smith, uh, council member for Ward 5. Terry Siemens, council member for Ward 4. And Fred Schultz, council member for Ward 6. Thank you. Uh, so, council member Siemens, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, why uh, residents of Ward 4 ought to elect you uh, at the, uh, in the election on November 5th? Well, thank you very much, Eric, and, and Eric and Bill, I thank you for bringing this forum uh, for the community. And again, thanks to uh, everyone here for coming out tonight and for listening at home. When I joined the council in 1999, uh, the key issues for me at that time were management issues. I felt that we had a number of problems uh, that surfaced over the first few years in the finance department, police department, recreation department. And I think we have, uh, during my time on the council, successfully turned that around to where we have a very well-managed city government now. Uh, during that time, we built the, this community center and uh, created a great resource for the community. Uh, we, uh, after getting the, the facility built, we, it actually took us longer than you would expect to, to get the facility to be well used. Uh, we had, um, had to work on uh, program costs, uh, keeping the costs down. And uh, I worked with uh, my colleagues to bring back the Yes Basketball League, which uh, is such a successful and needed uh, program for the young uh, people in this neighborhood and, and in the city. Uh, it has, I think, nearly uh, 700 participants uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I've led uh, efforts uh, to open the basketball court out here beside the community center uh, and found uh, a way to reopen the Piney Branch Elementary School pool. We, uh, we've continued to work on the management issues. Uh, again, I uh, worked with my colleagues on the council to develop a strategic plan for uh, better management of the government and uh, more accountability in our management. We uh, successfully worked together to bring food programs for uh, members of the community who are more vulnerable and increase funding for home repairs for our uh, vulnerable homeowners, uh, seniors uh, who have on limited income and unable to do their own home repairs. Uh, also uh, worked with Montgomery Housing Partnership to uh, bring them to the uh, city uh, to uh, have expanded ownership here in the city and uh, renovating the buildings. Uh, again, they're mixed-use buildings so that uh, our lower-income neighbors can remain in the city uh, as we've grown. I'm uh, very proud of the, the uh, participating with my colleagues on the council for some of the other programs, uh, you know, most recently environmental sustainability, uh, decreasing the voter age and increasing, expanding the uh, uh, registration and making it easier to vote. You don't have to just wait till election day. You can come out and vote for me uh, any time during the week, uh, election week. And... Um, we continue to work on important issues like uh, the Washington Adventist Hospital move and making sure that we have uh, adequate services left behind when they do move. But during the coming term, um, I think we still have work to do with our strategic plan. We need to refine that plan. We need greater uh, participation from the residents of the city 
and I hope to, to help my colleagues make that happen. Uh, we need an improved budget process where we uh, start earlier. We incorporate the strategic plan in our budgeting process uh, so that we make sure that we're actually budgeting for those things that, uh, that we consider to be the priorities in the city. Uh, and we need uh, better metrics to see if we are meeting uh, our plan uh, with the budget. But the biggest issues that I think uh, we face now here in the city, especially in my ward, are jobs. And I uh, plan to address that in three prongs. One is, uh, again, supporting the economic development uh, that we've started to work on uh, in the old Tacoma area, the Tacoma Junction, uh, and our other business districts, uh, such as along New Hampshire Avenue. But I think we also need to develop a stronger, uh, stronger assistance for our small business owners. And, uh, and we need to seek ways that we can be more supportive of our small businesses and uh, ensure that, uh, that they're strong and thriving here in the community. Council Member Siemens? Can you wrap I will up? wrap up. I will wrap up. I just say that uh, vocational training and uh, other type of training for the young adults in uh, the community is very important. Uh, we hear a lot of people talk about tired of seeing uh, kids on the street, young people on the street, but they need jobs. They need uh, some assistance in getting those jobs. So I'm going to wrap it up with that. But I thank you very much. I thank you for remembering uh, my proven uh, service to the community, my proven leadership, and I uh, just ask for you to vote for Terry Siemens for Ward 4. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have a, a statement from Eric Mendoza, who, uh, due to uh, work commitments, cannot be here tonight. Um, he sends his regrets. He says he was really looking forward to sitting down with the other Eric, Eric Bond. Um, he says this. This election has been a great motivation for my campaign and the people in Ward 4. All the hard work we've been putting in over the years is finally paying off, and we can see some changes now. We're not here for recognition. We just want the same respect as the other wards. Even though we live in different wards, we're still in one Tacoma Park. And thanks to everyone who has been reaching out to me on my views on 16 to vote. My campaign and I are grateful to take on that title of the leaders of the new generation new Tacoma. His priorities are as follows. One, racial profiling. Two, traffic and the speeding on Maple Avenue. Three, the renovation to apartments and rent increases. Four, car theft, public safety. Five, outreach programs. Six, let's find a way to bring back Carmen Lamb. Thank you, Eric Mendoza. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Um, okay, so uh, that's Ward 4. Those of you who are in Ward 4, those are your choices. Councilmember Siemens uh, and his challenger, Eric Mendoza. Uh, we have divided up, divided up the rest of the evening into um, two different sections. We're going to start out by talking about current city issues. And we've received many questions from uh, residents of Tacoma Park, and we will be um, asking uh, council and mayor to uh, respond to those questions. Uh, we are uh, going to allot three minutes for each question. Now, what we're, we're, how we're going to deviate from the past is that we are not going to go in a row and have each of you speak for one minute or two minutes or three minutes. Instead, we're going to ask all of you this question and uh, hopefully we'll have a conversation among you about you know the best response to whatever it is that's uh, you know on the mind of, of the resident. Uh, we'll uh, go through uh, a handful of questions. If we have members of the audience who have current questions that you'd like to ask of the council, um, we uh, ask you to write it down and uh, bring it to us. Um, where's our Emily Rainey is here. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh there. Okay. Right. So the young uh, journalist uh, here in the yeah thumbs with the thumbs up. Uh, she has paper and pen if you need it, and uh, she'll deliver the questions to us. Now, in the second, in addition. Oh. Um, 
those of you who are watching or anybody here who has the technology, you can also send a question uh, via Twitter. You can send it to a hashtag TP Election Forum. That's TP Election Forum. Okay, great. The uh, second half of the uh, of the evening will be talking about the city of the future. So uh, here we are in the 21st century. Uh, li we're living in the future, finally. Um, what is the city of the future going to look like? 25 years from now, what is Tacoma Park going to look like? And uh, we've gathered several questions ourselves. If you have questions that are not related to a current issue, but maybe about how Tacoma Park is going to look in 2025, uh, you can also uh, give us that question and uh, our young journalists will uh, deliver it to us. If you have a question about the future, on that uh, card, on that piece of paper, write City of the Future and then give us your question. So uh, with that in mind, I think we're ready to begin. Yeah. Okay. Can I go with go for it. my questions? All right. These, these are submitted by uh, members of the public by email before the uh, event. And uh, I'm going to go with this one. We've gotten a number of questions about this. Um, so, uh, I'm going to combine a couple of these. One of them is a horrendous story, which I'm sure we'll all be interested to hear. Uh, since July 1, there have been 21 residential burglaries in wards 2 and 3. A person writes, uh, I live on Sycamore Avenue and have been burglarized three times in, in about five years. Needless to say, my family feels very, very vulnerable. My seven-year-old is afraid to be alone in a given part of the house. My sister, who lives just down the street, was burglarized two weeks ago. So among my family, we've had four bur burglaries in five years. Uh, she goes on to describe that she had uh, a, a comp compu trace on her stolen goods, but was frustrated that even though she could find out wh where they were, the Tacoma Park Police told her that they didn't have um, a probable cause to give to the DC police to go in and take action. So they never, no action was taken, which was frustrating to them. So uh, she says, uh, so among all the crime questions, what are we going to do about crime? She says, I want to know how members of the council plan to hold our police chief and the rest of the department accountable for what feels like a ransacking of our neighborhood. I want to know if the council is certain they know if the relationship between the Tacoma Park Police and DC Police is adequate for an effective response to crime in Tacoma Park. I would like to take that one. Okay. Um, since it's uh, War 3, okay. I'll rock with it. Um, we have, in the last two to three weeks, had a meeting with the residents in War 2 and War 3 on Sycamore, Woodland, and Elm uh, with the chief of police. Uh, and he, I think all of the robberies, uh, the break-ins, have slowed down considerably because I, th I think, and uh, uh, Chief Goldberg, shake your head, uh, I think they uh, uh, may have uh, captured uh, many of the, per some, some of the perpetrators. Uh, getting everybody to lock their, I, this is a hard thing to say, lock their cars and lock their houses to make sure that it's a little bit more difficult to break in is one solution. Lighting is another solution. Uh, and I know that the chief and the residents talked about segways and electric bikes to, to be able, uh, which is an expensive solution, but, uh, uh, but might work also just so the, um, the bad guys know that that area is being uh, un, you know, is, is being really watched. Thank you. Thank you. Who gets the segways and the electric bikes? Say again. Who gets the seg segways and electric bikes? Um, the cops, the robbers, or the or the people who live there? <laughs> the, the police officers would get the segways uh, okay. and and the electric bikes, and and of course at that point, you know, the the perpetrators are not stupid; they can do the same thing. I mean, you know, they can tweet and, and get any information uh, on any uh, computer any time. Mm -hmm. They're not dumb. So does anybody else, else want to jump in on yeah, this? I'll jump in. Um, I heard a couple other things in that question, uh, and I want to try to remember to address a couple of them. 
Um, the first thing I want to say is that I think our police have been doing a great job of keeping our city safe. There are times like this when uh, there are a number of incidents in a concentrated area and it, and it really upsets people and I understand that but I want them to know that the police have been doing a great job. They have uh, had plain clothes in the neighborhood uh, and it, it really is helpful when, as Councilmember Daniels Cohen says, people do lock their doors. Uh, I know in a couple of instances in, in that neighborhood, uh, items that were stolen were, were, you know, just by a, basically by an open window, that kind of thing, uh, that makes it uh, really difficult to stop all these kinds of things. Um, and we have a, I think we have a pretty good relationship with adjacent agencies, uh, MPD, the district police department in particular. Uh, there were questions just in the last day or two that the chief was answering about the technology and about the uh, about being able to uh, talk on the same radio frequencies that uh, there are still improvements to be made and they're coming but those those technologies are basically close uh, in terms of some upgrades to the radio systems. Is, is, do any of you have a, a sense that perhaps uh, the Tacoma Park Police need to be held accountable for in doing an inadequate job or um, that we need to do something different in the way we handle the police? I would say that uh, my experience with Tacoma Park Police, they're doing a fantastic job, but they do have limited resources. There might be an issue in Ward 3, but my constituents in Ward 5 will call me about you know, criminal activity. So then I talk to the chief and uh, the senior command staff and ask them to surge resources into Ward 5. What happens? Resources, some resources may leave Ward 3. Um, it's 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 an ongoing issue. I mean, uh, we don't have a huge police department. We only have, I think it's 42 sworn officers. Uh, they have to try different uh, ideas and different techniques to try to uh, stop this criminal activity. And a lot of it comes from outside of Tacoma Park. So we do have to rely on agencies in Prince George's County and the District of Columbia, which makes it even more difficult. I, um, you know, I think accountability is important in managing any organization, and certainly our police department should be held accountable uh, for their, their performance. I don't have a concern at this time with the performance of the police department. Um, you know, uh, there are um, any, any one burglary is devastating to at least one family, if not a bunch of surrounding families. We recently had an attempted burglar, burglary in our neighborhood, and I know that that not only affected the individual whose house was, uh, was damaged by the attempted uh, break-in, but also the, all of the families in the neighborhood around are now very concerned about you know, what's going on, uh, why the surge. I think uh, what I would like to, to do as a council member is to work with the police chief to talk about you know, what steps can we take uh, towards um, crime prevention uh, to try to push that down. We heard some ideas uh, from Councilmember Daniels Cohen uh, with, uh, you know, educating the community about the need to lock their doors, lock their windows. Uh, we possibly uh, could look at uh, more security audits for, for homes so that a uh, police officer could go in or a city a staff member could go in and review homes to see if there are uh, particular steps that they could take to improve the locks on their homes or uh, if there are environmental design uh, things that could be done to trim bushes away from the, uh, the windows or better lighting. Um, there are you know, a number of steps I think that, uh, that maybe if we are weak it's in the, it's in the area of uh, what we can do as a community to uh, make our, our places more secure. Um, I haven't, I haven't heard that uh, from the police chief that, uh, that we're understaffed by any means. I think, uh, I think we're ad adequately staffed at this point, but I'd like to see us have zero burglaries in the city.
this is a big concern for a lot of people in the city. And uh, so I think it's worthwhile. I, I have kind of a question I dropped in before we move on to another, to the next question, which is, um, do you feel that we might be better off uh, letting the county uh, police our city instead of the uh, having our own police force with no. a problem oh, like this? Oh, they're ready for that one. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You see no. crouch for um, We know from having talked with the county uh, about uh, this very question that if they were to take over policing in the city, they would devote about 40% of the resources that we currently deploy for the police department. So we have 42 sworn officers. They would have about 16 or 17. We would not get anywhere near the level of service that we get by the city being in charge of our own police department. All you need to do is talk to someone who lives in the county of Prince George's, not in a municipality, and find out what kind of response they get. I, 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 in, at the front end of this, I forgot to say, I, I also think that our, our police force, uh, our full service police force, by the way, that is a full service police force, uh, is doing a, an incredibly good job. Um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, for some reason, this summer, somebody figured out that Sycamore, Woodland, and Elm were easy targets, and they just kept, kept on coming back. So uh, I, I also believe that our, our crime statistics in the city totally are much lower than they've been in the last 10 years. I, I, I think I've seen that. Okay. We'd like the, let me just also point sure. out that uh, I Quickly. think rough, roughly about 40% of city resources are devoted to the police department. So it's, yeah. it's, it's the one biggest thing that we do. Okay. We'd like to move on to some other questions. Uh, Council Member Schultz, I know you didn't get a chance to, to say much, but we'll, unless, if you have something burning, you can say it or you can I'll wait get my, the next I'll question. get in my licks soon enough. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, do you have another question, Bill? Boy, we're, they're piling up here. Uh, I just want to remind everybody uh, who's listening that they can send their questions uh, to us via Twitter to hashtag TP Election Forum. So uh, where to start? Good Lord. Um, well, this is, this is one uh, specifically about Ward 4. Since that's a hot race, we'll do that one. There's a culture of separation between homeowners and apartment renters. Even though they share Ward 4, they are largely disassociated from one another. And some would argue that apartment renters are largely disassociated from the current Ward 4 council member as well. What are your thoughts about that? If you believe it is a problem, what are you going to do to rectify it? So I guess the obvious person to answer that would be uh, Terry Thank Seaman. You. Thank you. First, I would like to say that uh, anyone feels disassociated from me, uh, I invite you to contact me at my home at 301-565-0190 or on my email at terrys at tacomaparkmd.gov, uh, email-wise. Um, I uh, certainly strive to reach out to all the residents of uh, my ward, and um, although I see some divide, uh, between the apartment dwellers and the uh, single-family homeowners. <coughs> I have worked diligently in my uh, long time on the council to try to bring people together to uh, work together on various projects and work together on uh, community activities. Uh, Ritchie Citizens Association, uh, under my leadership before I got on the council, uh, expanded our membership from just Ritchie Avenue to include the Franklin Apartments. Uh, this year we uh, voted to expand that further to include residents of other apartment buildings on uh, Maple Avenue. Uh, the, uh, uh, my wife and uh, several of our, uh, our neighbors worked together to form the Tacoma Park Community Action Group which reached out to uh, both single-family homeowners and apartment dwellers to uh, work together on holding community fairs and, and uh, many other activities. But, uh, you know, all those things don't matter if there's somebody sitting at home saying, well, but you haven't reached out to me. Uh, I'm sorry I've missed you. I, uh, I look forward to your joining us. And, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of community work to be done. 
uh, we appreciate your help and we appreciate hearing your ideas about where we should be doing more things. Thank you. Okay. Thank and you. Let me, let me just add that Council Member Siemens is tireless in going to all areas of the city and beyond in looking out for people and trying to connect them. Uh, he's done a better job of that than anybody that I've ever seen. And uh, just one other thing that he didn't, didn't mention, uh, various people got together last year and organized the World Festival. And there was the first one uh, this spring. And I think people look forward to that expanding. And that's to try and bring everybody together from all backgrounds and from all neighborhoods and uh, bring them together to celebrate. And, and the council also uh, passed a resolution that we can go in and talk to the dep uh, apartment manager and get permission to go and knock on doors. That's never happened. Am I right? We did, didn't we? Yes. yes. I mean, that is a major, major step forward for Ward 4, Ward 5, uh, for sure, or, or, uh, or vertical, have vertical dwellers instead of uh, uh, homeowners. So, uh, and I know that Mr. Uh, Councilmember Mayle has actually utilized that. He's seeing people uh, uh, that are apartment dwellers. I'm sure Councilmember Siemens is doing, doing the same. So it's pretty exciting stuff. I mean, uh, a lot of people said, oh, no, oh, no, but we still did it. Okay. Well, I'd like that's to, a perennial. Uh, oh, go ahead. offer some comment on this. I think it's important uh, when people feel like they're being dis they are disassociated or some way to, to remind everybody that communications is a two-way street. Um, and I understand that, you know, tenants – who live in built, these uh, landlord-owned buildings uh, sometimes are transient. They don't live here for maybe more than a year or two or three. But still, I think we as a group, and certainly myself specifically, uh, all try to make ourselves as available as we can. Uh, my business, my city business card has my personal home phone number. And I tell people, if you call my number, Either I'm going to answer the phone or my wife is going to answer the phone. They have my home address. Uh, they have my personal email as well as my city email address. Uh, I'm out and about driving around and walking my dog in the community. And I also encourage people to join listservs. And I realize, of course, that not everybody has a computer and not everybody is interested in getting on listservs. And that's fine. I can understand that. But we also have neighborhood associations that dis distribute flyers to all doors in the neighborhood about community meetings. So there's a lot of transactions and the possibility of, of transactions uh, for people uh, to take, uh, re regardless of what kind of an accommodation that they live in. And if people have needs, they have to take some responsibility on their own to contact me or my fellow council members or members of the government. Uh, and so, I mean, we, it's, I, I want and I beg people, I literally beg people to complain. I said, you, if you're concerned, it doesn't do me any good. I can't help you unless you let me know what is burning on your mind because then I can do something. But if you're going to not communicate that to anyone, then it's, it's, not, it's not easy to be useful to, to people. OK. Thank you. And um, all of you have about nine hours, right? No problem. Because <laughs> you know, questions are coming in. We have, a, we have a lot to get to. And we'll figure out you know, kind of how to maybe uh, jump in a little bit more um, and uh, and keep things a little bit shorter on some of these questions all of you know this whole discussion is all you know very very interesting and you know if we had nine hours we would we would sit here and do that we're used, we're used to, to sitting here for a while on yeah. Monday night well that is one of the questions so now but, we but have we all but we've also cut it way down lately <laughs> I've heard this we have a question from the audience uh, and actually we have two questions and one of them was a future question, but I'm going to ask it as a present question mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think it's a question for this council, not some theoretic council that is, uh, you know, 
running the city in 2025. So uh, this question is, I've been waiting more than 20 years for decent retail on New Hampshire Avenue. What will the city do to make this happen? Go, Fred. Well, I guess that seems to come close to me uh, in Ward 6 since New Hampshire Avenue bisects Ward 6 and includes uh, the University Boulevard uh, and New Hampshire Avenue uh, intersection. Um, and I share the questioner's concern, having lived uh, one block off of New Hampshire Avenue uh, for 27 years. And I've seen just in that period of time a lot of changes. We all <laughs> used to shop at the Safeway store, and that disappeared about five or six years ago. Uh, and that was frustrating. Um, there, there's, there is a certain amount of things that the city can do but and has already done. And first of all, to point it out, is that working with Montgomery County, uh, the, the, the county adopted a, a, a sector plan for that uh, cross, so-called crossroads area, which introduces uh, the kind of development that could occur the type of zoning that will regulate it, and urban design criteria that will tell a future developer uh, what their buildings can look like that would be acceptable to the neighborhood. Uh, that, all of that is legally adopted, so developers now know what they can do. But doing, having done that, um, that doesn't cause or force anybody to do anything. If you're a commercial property owner, and you're making good rents, you may sort of say, well, why, why should I tear down what I have and put in new stuff? So I think that the city, and I feel strongly about this, has an obligation. And when I say the city, I mean us on the city council as well as our staff to be proactive in trying to encourage, not just wait, for, not just wait, say, seven years for the Purple Line to, to be open or something like that, but to be taking aggressive steps now to find developers or, or to encourage the current property owners to take advantage of the Tacoma Langley sector plan. And I'll add that uh, in addition to that kind of that upper end of New Hampshire Avenue, we've also got the uh, New Hampshire Avenue Gateway, uh, East West Highway and on down toward Eastern at the district line. And we've been putting together planning efforts over the last few years to uh, come up with what we want there. We have uh, shopped those plans. We've worked cooperatively with Montgomery County, with Prince George's County, with uh, Park and Planning, and with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And through that, we've come up with some uh, grant funding to uh, enhance those efforts, and uh, like a million dollars plus was recently awarded. And uh, so there's going to be a lot more happening in terms of trying to make New Hampshire Avenue uh, what we need it to be. And I'll say just in reference to the Purple Line that I think the Purple Line is going to drive a lot of uh, redevelopment and also the, uh, the bus transit center that is due to be starting construction very soon. And uh, the city was very active in supporting the Purple Line. And uh, I testified a number of times in Annapolis on behalf of the city to uh, support various transportation bills to get money to be available for the Purple Line. And uh, I think those efforts have borne some fruit and we're going to see the Purple Line and that's going to make a big difference. Okay. And I'm going to uh, go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I'm biting my tongue here because th this gets into what I want to talk about with the future. Um, but since we're segueing, I'm going to break the rule and go right into it. Um, we're looking at... Um, New, Ham New Hampshire Avenue renovations with all the, as you say, the, the, the gateway, but all the way up, all the way up New Hampshire, yep. up to the D.C. border. We're looking at uh, Long Branch. They're going to bring the, the, the Purple Line, and that, that whole segment along around uh, Piney Branch and Flower, that's got, a new, that's got a new sector plan. We've got development happening uh, at Metro. And, you know, all the pictures and stuff I've seen of this, it looks like uh, Ellsworth Avenue in Silver Spring or... or Columbia Heights or Clarendon over in Virginia. It's all sort of mono architecture and chain store kind of things. And people talk about decent stores. You want to see decent stores. Well, there are stores there, but they're, they're you know, have, they have 
diversity. They represent, you know, some somebody's small little store that they've got that, that's got that sells, uh, you know, uh, ethnic uh, bakery or records or something like that. Uh, so we've got all this stuff coming. This is going to change our border areas considerably and area places that are just outside of our reach. And we aren't going to have any say what to do. And these, this is going to change the demographics. We're, we're talking about gentrification on a massive scale all the way around Tacoma Park. What's that going to do to us? I, I'm not sure that gentrification is going to change the diversity of the human beings that are, are I mean, I, you all have to understand, I live my life through rose-colored glasses anyhow. So uh, uh, I lived here when uh, what we called Langley Park was first built. That was just land, and they built the movie theater. Uh, there was a big Landsbergs, which is the building still there. Uh, it was a very nice uh, a commercial area, all four corners, the, the hot shops, you know, all four corners where something was going on. There were four liquor stores. Well, not in, in Tacoma Park, there weren't any. Right. Uh, right. And we all have to remember part of the issue is we stop, Tacoma Park stops at uh, going, going north at uh, at the Taco Bell, it's it, it, yeah University, University of the Taco Bell. It it then becomes Prince George's County, and then it stops at at Eastern Avenue. It becomes the District of Columbia. Uh, it, so there's some things we have no control over. Uh, I I wrote down you know you had said uh, 2025, and I I these are things. The purple line is completed. I don't want it to look like um, Silver Spring or Bethesda, I'd like for us to have some say in, in how it looks. And the fact that the, the, the community there is, is Hispanic, let's, let's uh, let those Hispanic folks uh, have some, it, something to say about what gets built there and how it gets built. What I fear is the, the single um, small business owners, because they're going to have to shut down while everything's torn down and built back up again, are going to not be able to stay alive, mm -hmm. you know. Just, just the, it's just the way it might be. So, uh, uh, but it, it, it's all doable. It, it needs a little bit of planning. A lot, actually, probably a lot of planning. <laughs> are we doing that? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, through the sector plan, and I'll look at Councilmember yeah. Schultz because he and I worked uh, hand in hand on this. Uh, we tried to make it, and, and the council, the whole council as well, tried to make it so that uh, in whatever changes do happen there that we can, as much as possible, retain the small businesses and retain the diversity that we have there and not just chase them out. So that as we looked at the, the zoning designations and the, the various uh, things that happen through these new zones, the CR zones, uh, that we can retain the flavor that's there now and just just not make it homogenous and looking like everywhere else. It's it's a it's a hard battle to to fight and to win, and you have to pay attention to it all the time, and you have to really care about it and to make it happen. Can, can I get and a, for instance, on that, you've you've got the, the city has a plan uh, on New Hampshire Avenue to have this uh, roadscape that's, that includes bike lanes, very advanced mm -hmm. bike lanes, but the county is saying, no, that's where the, the uh, rapid bus transit's gonna go. And, and so we, whose plan and is gonna win? And we, well, we're, we're, we've let the county know that we think our plan is much better, and we have to continue to pay attention to that and to make sure that as the bus rapid transit system gets designed for New Hampshire Avenue, that our vision is the one that carries the day. Right, and I Will think- it? <laughs> I we, think uh, in the future we'll find out. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, first of all that we do have decent shops and we do have decent stores uh, all throughout our city in the different business districts. Uh, the decency is in the eye of the beholder, uh, the eye of the people who's going there, uh, who shop at those places, and uh, the fact that some people would like to see uh, different types of stores. Uh, apparently, the uh, the marketing analysis has said that the population doesn't support those stores at this point in time. 
but I think that as we look towards the future, um, yeah, Mr. Brown's point is, is well taken. That we're going to see a lot of development around Tacoma Park uh, that is going to uh, gentrify those areas. And uh, we have to think about and uh, what we want in Tacoma Park, what we want to retain in Tacoma Park. We've been very proud of the fact that we are uh, like a small town in the, bi in the middle of this big megalopolis. And uh, so we've, to some extent, already faced those challenges in the past, and we've made policy decisions that have, have kept us uh, to have that small town character and a small town feel. And if we want to retain that, we have to continue to uh, set policies that, that maintain that. And, and I think uh, the mayor's example with the bike lanes and, and uh, rapid bus transit as an example, we, we have to stand up and fight for those things that are important to our community because we're talking about our community, the, the, uh, the geography that is ours. But an, another piece of that is that we want the commercial redevelopment so that we'll have the services that people want and need here so we don't have to drive somewhere else to get them. We don't have to drive to Silver Spring or Bethesda or Rockville or the district that people can use uh, their feet or their bicycle or uh, improve transit to get to that stuff and make it local and have the additional benefit of providing some money to the tax coffers of the city to pay for the services that we need. We, we are overly dependent on single-family residential for our tax base. We, <clears throat> we know that. And we had a great example of this Monday night at the council meeting where we had a budget amendment uh, accounting for some new revenues coming in from one business that opened. And I had forgotten that they opened Chuck E. Cheese, Chuck e. Cheese. at Tacoma Langley. Mm -hmm. And our, uh, our amusement and admissions tax is a 10% tax on, I think it's like when you have like uh, games and machines that you put money in and you get, yeah. we get 10%. The, the average amount per year that we've been getting from that tax has been about $600. Just Chuck E. Cheese will be contributing about $135,000 a year per Whoa. year for that. That's an extra $135,000 in our revenues, which is the equivalent of about uh, six-tenths of a penny on our tax rate. So this is our juvenile gaming uh, <laughs> strategy. There you right. go. Okay. <laughs> but that, that business is an example of what just a few additional businesses up there that are good uh, business models can mean for the tax base of the city and therefore our ability to finance the things that we want to provide for all of our residents. But it we, is a balancing act between, you know, the revenues and what do we want as a community and... and you know, Eric's comment about, you know, child gaming. You know, is that, is that really what we want? And if it is, then, then it is a benefit to the community. If it's not what we want, then it's a detriment. We don't get taxes from, we don't get a chunk of sales taxes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. No. So if we, get, if we get money from businesses, it's if there's a quirky law like that or how else? Or property tax. Property tax. Yep. So if the, if the businesses are and, fancier, the property and, values and, go up. And also from the business personal property tax, which is on the equipment, the inventory. Oh, yeah. The one that they want you to ex waive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, uh, can I add one thing? Yes, please. And that is, Bill, I, I, I hear this sort of uh, 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 apocalyptic vision of what's going to happen when the purple line comes and that how gentrific gentrification is going to uh, sweep over the uh, Langley Park and East Silver Spring area, uh, and I don't buy that. Um, I, I think that th this vision is uh, erroneous, and the reason I say that is that I've, I'm, I'm, my concern is, is are we ever going to find serious developers who are going to look at the crossroads area or the Long Branch area and say to themselves, hmm, here's an area where I can do some serious reinvestment and um, build out these properties in accordance with the zoning that is, uh, will, will be offered in, in each of those sector plans. I don't see any evidence of it at all. In fact, the, the property owners that I've talked to who hold large tracts of this land are saying, 
well, we're going to wait until the purple line's built. They're not saying we're going to wait till it's approved, okay? That which might be this, this year, uh, and then we'll see. Uh, and so keep in mind as well that there's a lot of metro stops around the, the metropolitan area that have virtually no development around them at all. Look at West Hyattsville. That, that purple, that uh, metro stop's been there for 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know how long it's been there. It hasn't affected that area at all. So, and, I mean, and, even Tacoma Metro, it took them about 30 years. Yeah, I mean, okay. so these things may happen, uh, but if we're going to hold our breath, a lot of the people in this room will be uh, pushing up the daisies before these things actually happen. So the, I think our goal is is that we want we want to see development, but we don't want to see, quote, gentrification and economic displacement of small businesses. And what Mayor Williams is saying is that on our side of the county line, we've got zoning, I think, that will allow us to have our cake and eat it, too, because it's extraordinarily innovative zoning, as zoning goes in the United States. And I think it's, it, it will provide us an opportunity. Now, I'm optimistic about that, but I think that change is going to come slowly, my goal, and I think our goal, is that we want to see all boats rise in this sort of thing. We don't want to see developers just get rich at the expense of, of, of what we have there now. But on the other hand, we all want to see more economic development and more choices when it comes to retail and restaurants and that sort of thing. If I can just yeah, sure. say a few things. I'm not as in – I believe that the Langley Park – Area, or the Long Branch area will see development. I think that uh, it's cl so close to downtown Silver Spring, which has seen a lot of new uh, apartment buildings, multifamily units, that it's natural for developers to move to the Long Branch area. Montgomery County's housing department, every day they're trying to figure out how to bring more affordable housing to Silver Spring. Montgomery County spends actual money to bring affordable housing. It's not just playing with zoning or managing paper like our department does for rent stabilization. They actually invest in it. So as more people move to Montgomery County, because right now the county has almost a million residents, a large percentage of those people need affordable housing. Long Branch is going to provide that opportunity. I don't think it's going to take 10 years for that to break ground. I think it's going to be something that's going to happen. It may not be the entire area, but we will see new development there, I think, in the next three to five years. You've already seen the facade changes on the 7-Eleven and some of those where the, uh, I think it's Pizza Hut delivery place, where the landlord came in and improved all the facades. So now, if you go across the street where there's the Flower Avenue Theater, you have giant foods behind there, that also becomes an opportunity. If you look in Wheaton, that safe way was completely redeveloped with multifamily apartments put on top of it. Mm -hmm. I think developers are looking at Long Branch because it's too expensive to continue to develop in downtown Silver Spring, and it's so close. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Oh, I, I want you to ask a tough question. Okay, I got some tough questions here, guys. Put on your armor. Um, Th these ones weren't tough? No. <laughs> um, this is... Uh, okay, uh, there were... Uh, this, this, uh, this person uh, wrote and said that there were... Um, and this is, I, I admit, I didn't look into this too much, but this is what I'm told. There were two Freedom of Information requests in the last two years for council emails using their official government email addresses. After that, all of them started using a personal email instead of their city email. Why is every council member using their personal email for city business? And is it, a shield, it, is it to shield them from having their communications made available to the public? Would the council members support a change the city ethics regulations to require council members and city staff to use city email for city business. If I like, if <laughs> well, everybody, well, they jump jumped in. in. Wow, okay. <laughs> Our personal email 
anybody can find out whatever we're sending that has to do with city business under our personal email. The it, personal it, email is discoverable just as uh, and is, is required to be disclosed uh, just as the city email accounts are. Uh, personally, I've used my personal email address uh, since I first joined the council. Uh, I've always used it, have disclosed every email I've gotten when asked for them. Uh, and every email I've sent. So I don't, uh, I don't think there's an issue there. Um, if for some reason someone feels that they have not received uh, email conversations on uh, city policy issues that uh, have taken place, then they should uh, co complain about that to our city attorney or to the state's attorney general. Okay. I use both. And the reason being is that a lot of times when people send emails to my council email address, it ends up in my spam folder. So if I don't check my spam folder, I don't know you sent me an email. That's the only reason I use both. And, and there was a wrong premise in there that council members were using uh, their government emails and then when there was a request, jump to their personal email addresses. I think it was, if anything, it's probably more the other way around. We try and use the, our, our city emails uh, whenever we can. I know a lot of times I'll use my personal email, but I always send to everybody else's government email so that even, if, even though it's coming from my personal email, it's, it's kind of caught in the, in the city servers and foyable that way. And uh, I know we've had requests and uh, you know, it's, it's easy to go through and come up with them all. Okay. The term that the mayor uses, foyable, which re refers to Freedom of Information Act, which is, means that people can apply and ask for government records, which include communications between government officials. And, and, the, and the background those on, taking place on personal right. email address. And, and, and further background on and this is that there's the Maryland uh, Open Meetings Act, yeah. right. which has to do yeah, with yeah, yeah. Uh, that all meetings between more than three mm -hmm. council members has to be public. Anybody can attend, and uh, which is sort of, uh, you know, um, it, they say email does not come, come under that law. Neither does written uh, communications. But I think a lot of people, I mean, I'm not going to say you're taking advantage of it, but you can use email to get work done that you, so you don't have to call an open meeting. Is that, is that fair? No, I don't think that's no. a the, the fair. The state's attorney if general has said that email communications are not covered under the uh, Open right. Meetings Act for that very for the reason that it, the conversation is not taking place concurrently at the, at the same time. Right. Uh, but uh, when someone requests under the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, the email discussions for a given policy issue. Uh, then uh, can be disclosed. It's disclosed, right? right. But yeah, I mean, I can't imagine you get all your work done in open meetings, especially like here, at, just at city council member meetings. You must have some email traffic going. I will, right. I will tell I you that since, if I can just uh, <laughs> wrap up, um, since I joined the council, when I got on the council, I felt like there was a lot of uh, discussions happening, you know, in the hallway, and mm -hmm. I think the council has has really been very attentive to that, and we frequently remind each other when we're uh, in a group of four or more that uh, we shouldn't be talking about policy or if the conversation shifts into a policy discussion that uh, we, we cut each other off on that. So I, I think the council has gotten very good at uh, being attentive to that. I'm sorry. Fred. No, I defer to you because you, you've got a race that you need to win and I'll get, let you have the time. <laughs> I'm, uh, but I... Uh, to, to say something uh, more on point, I, I think there's a sort of an idea that w we can all kind of get together on the email and discuss issues, the seven of us, and kind of process uh, policy. And, and it, it couldn't be further from the truth. E emails uh, is great for communicating and sort of saying, I think, to sort of an express an opinion or an idea, but that doesn't mean any of us respond to it or that we may not just say something totally the opposite. So it's a very fragmented process. Uh, and if we had to rely on email to get anything done among the seven of us, nothing would get done. It's just, I mean, maybe it's, it's even difficult to coordinate something that we all want to do and get on, like 
the, the council retreat or what it is we want to have for dinner at, uh, at, a, at a closed session in the uh, staff room. And the other thing I want to say is that the Open Meetings Act, which obviously is a good law uh, because it protects the public, um, what that basically means, and this is something that I've, it's been it's frustrating, is that when one of us says, oh, I've got an interesting thing that I want to talk to my fellow council members uh, conceptually about, I can't really have that conversation uh, except for two of them at a time. Because to have it with conversation with three or more means that we're talking to public policy, and that's against the rules, and we all respect that. So then where's, when do we talk about it? Well, we talk about it, we should, in a public meeting right here in this spot right here. But our public meetings have agendas and they have form and there's no real time except for council comment period to talk about something and usually that's extremely limited time-wise as it should be. And so it's sometimes very difficult to do, have explorative kind of conversations about substantive issues because there's no real pl place for it to take place in, this, in the way that, that, that is allowed under the state's Public Meetings Act. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I know everyone on the, this, I've only done this for two years, and everyone is very cognizant of what is Public Information Act, PIA, and if it even starts swinging a weensy to that, stop. It's, the talk has stopped. I didn't go to a meeting last week, uh, a breakfast meeting, because I would have been the fourth council member and it would have caused us uh, to not be able to discuss, it caused everybody to not be able to discuss any policy and it was going to be something probably policy was going to be discussed at. So uh, it, it, we're really uh, hugely aware and and take great care in not crossing that line where it, it it's supposed to be you know public and 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 we're you know just us people secretly talking amongst mm -hmm. ourselves and, and I see you all got together on this answer just, just, a, yeah. <laughs> just a reminder that the uh, the the operative rules here concern a majority of the council talking about anything that is legislative or could lead to legislative yeah. wow. action. So that there are things that if it's not legislative, it's not covered by that law. So that uh, when we have a closed session, those things are covered by that law, but there's a reason why you can close the session. We close them in public and we give the reason. If it's not covered by the law and we're going to talk about something, it's an administrative function session, which means it's things like oversight of an employee like the city manager. Right. Okay. Um, we should oh, move. Yeah, we should move on. Um, do you want to ask a question from uh, the audience here tonight? Yeah, well, um, well, while we're doing hard ones, <laughs> okay, Councilmember Smith, get your, get your uh, armor on. Uh, given your effort to overrule the recommendation of the Citizens Advisory Committee and give grant money to an organization they did not recommend, but with which you had personal familiarity, long sentence here, could you comment on the appropriate role of citizens advisory committees in preventing favoritism or corruption among public officials in giving grant monies? As an editor, I have to say that's a very long sentence. This had to do with, uh, uh, there's an organization in the city called EduCare. It is a food pantry they also provide um, workforce <coughs> development and computer, computer training for residents in Tacoma Park and at their location at Grace Methodist Church on New Hampshire Avenue, they do it for residents of Prince George's County also. Bef the only way I knew about them is when I read an article in the Gazette newspaper. I had never met the executive director. I had never met any one staff of the organization. All I did was read an article and said these people are doing great work. There is the name of uh, the committee that you mentioned brought forth a number of uh, 
organizations that the city should give grants to. And one of them was food for Montgomery County, healthy food for kids of Montgomery County. I believe that's the, the term, the, uh, the name of the group. My issue with them is city of Tacoma Park, even Montgomery County Council does not have control over the school system. We cannot tell the school system what type of food they should provide the students. So why are we investing any money into an organization, and it was only $2,500, that is not going to change the type of breakfast, lunch, that the students are going to be provided? And at this time when this request came up, I believe it was during the winter, there is a large need, according to this article in the Gazette, for people to have food. This was like in November, December, you know, during the holidays. So it made sense for me to try to provide some of that need, to try to provide food for those families that are in need during the holidays. So that's why I said that EduCare should get the grant rather than this other organization where they would not have any impact on Montgomery County Public Schools. It's a separate body. The other thing is these committees and commissions are advisory. Whatever they tell the council does not mean that the council has to follow their conclusions. All they are is giving their advice to us. Okay, but I will say that we've tried to uh, expand the opportunities for those committees to make recommendations, particularly about uh, small grants that we might do or large grants that we might do. Uh, and we, what we want to do is make sure that, uh, to the extent possible, that the, the recommendations and the, the information that we get uh, come to us and that we can get good information from those committees on which to base decisions rather than us get involved in the in all of the details of that. So to the extent possible to uh, push that away from us having to make kind of nitty gritty decisions on that, Do which, doesn't, which doesn't preclude what he was just Do saying. Do you generally follow the recommendations of the advisory committee? Generally. Okay. And this is, the, the city makes grants, so they have two programs, the small grants and the large grants. This is a large grant? Small grant. Small grant, okay. And um, you have certain guidelines and you have a committee to help you decide. So, so, and we're, so we're, we're trying to combine small grants, the large grants, and the community development block grants hmm. and, and have that all go through one yeah. committee. Okay. Great. Are How you, are we doing on time? We're not doing great on time. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, it's 840, and oh. uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, so obviously we're not going to get to all of the present-day questions. Okay, but we do have these written down, and we can make them available uh, and get written responses to these if we haven't tired you guys out too much. Oh, great. We're not any close. To, <laughs> look, we're used to being here till 11 o'clock, so. Yeah, I know. We're, not, we're, we're just getting warmed up. We're, we're feeling for the audience, however. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, lately, we've only been here till 10. Right. So we could, you know. We yes, can you go have. till 1230, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, do, we, do we go to the next term or future? What yeah, do you let's, go to, let's go to the future. Okay. Or next, let's go to next term first. Yeah. Well, let's, well let's, here's, a, here's a segue question. Um, and it's one of the questions that was submitted. After re-election, what are your top priorities for the next two years? Which, which is, you know, what I was going to ask, what is your agenda for the next two years? What do you hope to accomplish? Now, me, on, on this question, I really will be timing you. So, you know, okay. none of you go past a minute. I'm fascinated. I don't know about you. I'll, I'll, <laughs> no, go ahead. I'll, I'll give a plug no. uh, for our. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what's the phrase I want? The uh, our uh, strategic plan. Huh. Uh, we have uh, gone gone through that and pulled uh, a number of uh, items from that that are in the current budget going forward. And we're going to have a council retreat. Each one of us has uh, basically prioritized them. I think there were 37. We ranked them 1 to 37. And uh, we're going to get together and have a retreat on November 12th at uh, Washington Adventist Hospital. It is an open meeting, so people who want to come can come. And we're going to discuss with a facilitator 
uh, our priorities, and uh, that will give us, a, I hope, a firm basis for uh, both the council and the uh, staff to go forward with the priorities of the city and not just have it be each of our priorities separately, seven different sets of priorities, but to get a real sense of what our priorities are as a group. Okay, see, strategic plan. Yep. Okay. I can tell you that my, I think the top three priorities is resolving with the county the issue over municipal tax duplication because that threatens us seriously. Second is uh, dealing with the uh, certificate of need application from Washington Adventist Hospital that will be uh, probably allowing them to relocate to White Oak and that also means what happens to the medical, what kind of medical services will be at the Tacoma Park, the Tacoma Park campus. And number three is seeing that the crossroads uh, area um, continues to move forward with regard to economic development in the broadest sense of the word. Thank you. I think I answered this question in my uh, earlier statement, but I would just like to expand on that and, and talk about the one spe specific thing that I think is the number one priority in Ward 4, and that is the uh, assisting the young adults to reach a higher level of self-sufficiency. And I'm talking about getting a job and uh, getting better jobs than what many of them are able to today. Uh, I was able to uh, support my council colleagues in getting uh, money into the Man Up program this year for mentoring uh, of, of some of the young people and $20,000 into the budget for vocational training this year. And that was uh, something that was new for us and it's uh, greatly needed. It's moving us in the direction that we need to go. We need uh, this year and this coming term, I want to see how the city can be uh, more supportive of getting the training and assistance that the young people need so that they can be uh, contributing members of the community. Thank you. Okay. There are a no number of issues that are important to me and specifically Ward 5 uh, in this next term. One is Washington Adventist Hospital. It is in Ward 5. It's probably arguably the largest institution in the city. Uh, what happens on that site will have a ripple effect throughout Tacoma Park. Um, so we have to get it right. Then moving what is left behind, who backfills that space. Me personally, I'd love to see Washington Adventist University uh, play a larger role on the campus. I've already talked to some of their administration about it. It is something that they're thinking about. Uh, another item that's important to me is this past summer I created a lunch and learn program at uh, Essex House. This is the first time this was, has ever happened. I provided free lunch through Montgomery County Public Schools and a literacy learning component through our library. I'm going to cut you off, and we're going to come back to that. Okay. Okay, I made a note. All right. I'm going to move on to hear what uh, <laughs> Those uh, are Council my Member Daniels. <laughs> For once, things. I'm sticking okay. to my clock. Okay. All right. Uh, things I, I need to get completed in these next two years are the uh, Sligo Creek Overlook uh, Park. We started with Pinecrest about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, uh, and it, uh, it just... I don't know that it got put on the back burner, but it feels like the back burner. So with the, they requested a, 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 a playground uh, right next to the uh, uh, 460, the VFW, and uh, we're working on that. We have the, the land. We've got the plans. Uh, we're also working on all of their the sidewalks they requested two years ago, and that's, it, that's in the game plan. Um, uh, other things, uh, you know, I, I wrote down utopia. I probably spelled it wrong. But uh, I have been trying to get the crosswalk back in at, at uh, the co-op and uh, Grant Avenue for many years because that's how it used to be. I want to see that happen, and that's going to be making nice. Time's up. Highway administration. Okay. Oh, good luck. I'm and, and you didn't give me a time's up, so I'll say tax duplication, tax duplication, tax, tax duplication. Tax duplication, okay. tax duplication. Which actually, and, and I am coming back to the lunch and learn, because I'm very interested in that. But uh, 
when uh, Councilmember Schultz talked about tax, tax duplication, it reminded me that we're talking about 25 years in the future. Now, I'm very aware that 25 years ago in the past, a certain newspaper in town started. And one of the issues that was discussed in that tax first year was tax duplication, right? So here we are 25 years later. So 25 years from now, how will that, will we still be having a discussion about tax duplication? Can we give a brief tutorial on what this is so people who are watching know? <laughs> there goes the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, okay, Bri briefly, uh, uh, we get taxed by the county for services they don't provide us because the city provides us those taxes, w which we have to also have to pay for. So we're paying both the city and the county for the same services such as public works, uh, recycling, uh, library, police force. Recreation. Recreation. We get some back, but not a lot. And they're about to, they've just come out, they're threatening to come out with a new formula, which really uh, is not very kind to us. Yeah. Like 40% yeah. less yeah. or something. They're, and, and there's, there's, there's two basic ways that this can be addressed. One is a tax offset where people's tax rate, their county tax rate, is lowered by the amount that the county doesn't provide the services. So it would result in the county, county tax rate going down and the city tax rate going up, hopefully by not as much. That happened in Frederick County and it didn't go up as much. Uh, or the tax duplication payments, which happen now, which is everybody has the same tax rate to the county, and for the services we provide, money comes back. The, the county is basically the 800-pound uh, gorilla in this. They set the rules, and if they don't want to pay us, they don't pay us. And so the battle over the years has been, it should be more. We need to fix the formulas. We've tried to fix the formulas, and where we are right now is, in trying to fix the formulas, they said, oh, gee, we'll keep a bunch of your money, and now we're going to do what you were just describing, Bill, where uh, they, they're proposing to make it. Uh, so that we only get 40% of the money, and the rest of the money is maybe available as a grant, and we would have to apply for it every year, but it's for covering continuing services that we provide. So basically, the county is keeping our money. I'll it's just say it that a lot more expensive to live here. I'll just say that I think your story is going to be the same 25 years from now that it was 25 years ago, unless we annex the rest of the county. I'm more hope I'm I'm more hopeful than that. Okay, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Bill, did you have a question about the uh, city of the future you wanted to? Uh, city of the future, uh, I do. Um, all right. Although I'm torn here because we we had a, you were talking about the Washington Adventist Hospital, and this person says that uh, the certificate of need says that it's just been uh, sent, oh boy, this is a complicated issue. The, the Washington Adventist Hospital is leaving town. Uh, they're moving to a different location. They want to. They've applied to the state to do this. They've just f uh, filed their application. And this person says that, uh, who apparently has read it, says that it leaves only services for low-income people and the mentally ill. What will the city do in, to ensure there'll be, there will be quality health services including an emergency room for all of us. And I understand they can't have an emergency room. It's got to be urgent care, which I don't know how, what, how that difference. And, but if you could briefly deal with that. And, and let me first say that we're going to have a public hearing, well, a presentation and a public hearing on December 9th. It's good, that meet, that's a special meeting, and it's only going to be about Washington Adventist Hospital. Uh, the president of the hospital is going to be here and make a presentation about what it is they're proposing in the certificate of need. Then there's going to be an opportunity for public comment, and then there's also going to be an opportunity for the council to discuss it. So that's going to be the single, sole topic of December Is, is this an accurate uh, representation that they're only going to leave services for low-income people and the mentally ill? No. Okay. No. He said no. Okay. Oh. Okay. The future. Here's, your, here's our top question. Will Tacoma Park ever have a nightlife? We, ha we have a nightlife now. We have a nightlife. <laughs> the part where everyone goes to bed? Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, ha we have a lot more nightlife than we used to. We have a lot more going on in this building than we used to. That's this room is now multi-purpose instead of a dedicated council chambers. Um, there's all kinds of performances going on, uh, things to do. Granted, we are not, you know, Logan Circle, DuPont Circle, we are, we are not those areas, and I don't think people want us to be. 
but I think there is a lot more going on, and I look forward to the new restaurant opening in town very soon, Republic, and that will be open, I think, until 11 o'clock, and we'll have bars, and there's the Olive Lounge, and there's, so there's more going on where there's opportunities for some uh, evening activities. You drop by the Olive Lounge almost any night, and you can, I don't think you can even get in there. There's so so many people there. Well, this crowd would fill it up. It's, right. it's small. It's great. It's, we love it, but it's small. <laughs> it, yeah, it is small. Yeah. But, uh, and no room for music or anything like that, or dancing or anything like that. Yeah. So you want music and dancing girls? Well, I don't. Well, I don't know if I do. <laughs> well, always. But uh, some, uh, you know, some of the younger folk people we want to bring into the city. Because, I mean, my observation is that, uh, that people are moving downtown, and there's quite a, quite a scene down there for, for young folks, and uh, yeah. it's there, it, the, the city is coming back to life, but the, it's, everyone is moving there from here, or from the suburbs. The, the Tacoma Park, uh, the, the junction, make the junction function is what I call it. Uh, in all of our questionnaires, people said food, People said traffic, people said parking, but no one said dancing and nightlife. That's what's, and we got more food, and we got more made, traffic. It, it, well, we got more traffic, of course we did, and uh, uh, and parking, yeah, but uh, uh, and I guess if somebody had said nightlife, we we could have you know thrown in dancing girls and boys and everybody. Discos. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, uh, yeah, disco balls and whatever. I, th I think that nightlife, what the definition of nightlife depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the redevelopment that's going to be occurring in the Long Branch area, one of my dreams would be to see somebody take the Flower Theater and convert yeah. it into either a, a place where there was a, music and drama or into an arts theater, something that can compete with the theater in Greenbelt that uh, we go to about once a month because there's no other theater that shows the movies at the price we want. The, you know, that could be a wonderful opportunity. The CR zoning in, uh, that's being imposed will give, will give, there's incentives for developers to, to do sorts of things like that, meaning that if they can build this kind of vital commercial development, let's call it that for lack of a better term, they can get more density. Uh, so, it, but that's, <coughs> that's going to take some time, but I think it can come, and I think it's already coming. I mean, I think we, we see what's happening with Republic and uh, Bus Boys and Poets is coming mm. and stuff like that. I think it harks back to the earlier question about, uh, you know, better businesses on, uh, on New Hampshire Avenue. It's the same concept. Yep. And that is uh, each of us know what's, what we think is going to be a better Tacoma Park, and that's why it's important that we spend a lot of time on outreach to the community and getting community members to participate in the visioning process for the city. And I think if uh, there's a publication uh, comes out once a year called What's So Special About Tacoma Park? And I think if everybody reads that, I'm not going to say who publishes it, but if everybody reads that, What's So Special About Tacoma Park, you will be shocked at all the things. I mean, it's tight, all the things that go on every week. So, uh, it, I mean, it's really pretty exciting. I, I read it, and I can use it almost so we, every So week. we have good day life. That's what we have. Yeah. <laughs> so. Can I... Council Member uh, Hans Reimer is leading the task force to create a, a nightlife, nightlife entertainment for Montgomery County. There's I don't a think task force for that. Yes, oh, okay. yeah, it's a oh, it's a. Check it. okay. <laughs> uh, I I don't think there's going to be nightlife as they want in Silver Spring or even Bethesda in Tacoma Park. I don't think that the uh, storefronts are big enough to uh, handle the capacity that would make sense for uh, a, uh, a tenant uh, that would want to run a bar, or, or, and you can't even run a bar in, in Montgomery County uh, without serving some type of food. 
And, you know, I don't think there's going to be any type of clubs. I don't think the residents are <laughs> want anything like that in Tacoma Park. So, yes, you may have more restaurants. Restaurants may stay open later. Quality of those restaurants will improve, but we're not going to have a nightlife like traditionally people think of it. And if people want to read a good article that explains kind of the differences in how various uh, generations think about this, there was a good article in today's post in the dining section on uh, millennials and boomers and how the two age groups see things very differently. Hmm. And Tacoma Park, yeah, I mean, I think everybody here knows is basically built on an anti, not an anti, but but a no drinking. I mean, there was not a liquor store inside within the city limits of Tacoma Park, and I'm not sure there's even one today. Well, there, there is one, one? in ShopRite. Uh, okay, and, and I, I know Taliano's. When I saw Taliano's and it said, uh, you know, it was a place you could get a drink, I went, oh, my goodness. B.F. Gilbert is doing flip-flops in his grave because that was not, you know, the deal. Well, here... I'm, here's my question, my uh, city of the future question. Um, when I look at Tacoma Park, uh, you know, and, and having covered Tacoma Park for you know 20 years or you know thereabouts, um, there, there's been a lot of change. But but one thing that has remained is has been a commitment to economic diversity. You know, a lot of places in the country people talk about diversity, but. Tacoma Park focuses a lot on the economics of diversity, and so there are uh, uh, rental policies in place that encourage uh, uh, their, uh, a diverse uh, uh, pe people from diverse economic situations in this city, and uh, makes it fairly unique in Montgomery County, um, in, in any of the surrounding areas. Now, um, the homeowners, have uh, have seen this you know boom in the uh, value of their homes and I think that it has been reflected in you know perhaps the incomes of new residents coming into Tacoma Park look ahead 25 years from now what are we looking at do you think in terms of economic diversity and then if you if you want if you care to um, do you think we want economic diversity if so how our future councils going to keep that in place if you if we don't want economic diversity stand up and say that we you know we want to look like Kensington or uh, you know Bethesda you know okay. I don't think we want to look like uh, like any other jurisdiction I think Tacoma Park takes great pride in 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 our diversity and and the diversity economic diversity is is really the the bottom line factor there and, and people move to this city because of that diversity and because of the, the character and the reputation that the city has built and that we continue to try to build as being uh, environmental leaders and, and all other things. But the, the diversity of incomes that we have by our residents in our city is a big part of uh, what makes this city special and why people want to live here. I think it's going to be a real challenge to maintain that diversity and something that the council is going to have to, uh, you know, examine ways to maintain that, uh, especially as the economy picks up. We started to see some of the um, uh, dissolving of that diversity uh, back when the housing boom was going on because uh, owners of apartment buildings found that it was... Uh, uh, money maker for them to convert their low-income apartment buildings to condominiums and sell them at a high price. Uh, I think uh, we've had a little uh, hiatus in that with the, uh, the bad economy, but I think that as we move forward, uh, the council is going to have to uh, work with city residents to see what do we really want and, and how are we going to set policies that uh, maintain the level of diversity that the community wants. I think we also have to remember that uh, ev even with the uh, more expensive single-family homes in town, we're still relatively affordable in Montgomery County. You know, we have probably on average among the lowest median housing prices. So it's not just 
uh, affordable rental housing, but it's affordable owner opportunities as well. It may not seem that way when you look at the price and, you know, relative to what some of us paid for our houses and what they're going for now, but it's still relatively affordable compared to the rest of the county. Well, we've, yeah. got, we've got a lot of these new people coming in and, and uh, the, the kind of people who can afford to live here now are not necessarily know our history or appreciate it. I mean, is, are there ways, is there anything the council can do to um, encourage the knowledge of that history? I mean, at one time point you talked about having, I think it was a wall of fame or, or a, and, and we've, we, something like that. We, we set up uh, having a committee uh, to uh, kind of recognize our, the history of our people and rec recognize uh, that so that we don't forget all of that. You know, we, we do a little better job of kind of recognizing our buildings, but not the people. And so uh, I think this coming uh, Monday night, we're going to name the first couple people to that committee hmm. and uh, look for ways to uh, share the history of this community with everybody. I think uh, that the council should continue to support Historic Tacoma and some of their events uh, that talk about our history. I know I've had coffee with Nancy Abbott, whose father this building's named after. Uh, she's releasing a lot of his documents to Historic Tacoma to give some perspectives and context of some of the battles that we're fighting now that were fought you know, many years ago. But yes, uh, Historic Tacoma, I think, would be a a great entity to push what Tacoma's Park is about, what our history is, and what it means to live in Tacoma Park. Okay. Yes, as uh, you know, as we get farther and farther away from the the Lee Jordans, uh, the Bell Zigglers, uh, I mean, uh, the Sammy Abbots, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's more and more difficult to continue the history because there is a rich, rich, exciting history that this city has Fr from the very beginnings in 1890 at B.F. Gilbert buying the tract of land, going to Battle Creek, getting uh, hooking up with the Seventh-day Adventists because they had health as their one of their major tenants, bringing them down here and then the city growing from there. It's, uh, it, it, it's awfully exciting, and I'm, I'm just going, you know, the minor skirmishes, plus all, all of the volunteers, uh, all the people that are involved in, 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 uh, in making the city actually operate, uh, people that don't get paid for anything. They just do it. So uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's very unique, and I don't think it'll ever be a Bethesda, as long as I'm around, I'm not going to let it be Bethesda. Bethesda's great. It's fine. But Tacoma Park is, is Tacoma Park and very, very, very special. I seem to recall an Opal Daniels. Also. Oh, yeah. Did I leave her problem? out? Mm -hmm. Opal. I left Opal out, and there was Henry, too. So. <laughs> let me uh, can, add yes. something here. My judgment is, is that, and I don't have any proof of this at all, that we have in this city probably a seven to eight percent turnover of residents, new residents every year. So, and I think that's probably conservative, because probably in your rental units it might be a bit higher, a good bit higher than that. Um, so you could think that maybe if that's accurate, then in five years you've got basically a third of the city is going to have been new people who've been here five years or less. And um, what, what I, why I say that is that Tacoma Park's going to change. It, you know, it's important, like my colleagues have said, to revere our past, to make sure that the people who come here know about it, uh, so that they understand the, the institutions we have, why we have them, and why they're going to continue. But the, tw the city of 25 years from now has got to be somewhat different than it is today. But I, when you look at the housing stock, the, it's going to attract certain kinds of people. And ward, certain historic areas, you've got Victorians that are going to attract a certain kind of people. 
And in my wards, you got 1950s ramblers that are going to attract a different kind of an income bracket. I think that also helps to sort of predetermine that this is always going to be a, a very mixed city economically. Uh, there's a lot of uh, – the, the range of housing in this city is extraordinary price-wise and, and uh, image-wise. Uh, and it's, it's important we keep all, always keep that in mind because if you just live th – look at one neighborhood and generalize from that, you can get off base very easily. So. I, we're going to change, but I don't, I mean, listening to the people, that, I mean, when I talk to people, as I've been doing the last few weeks door to door, most of the people I find, you know, love this city. They love it the way it is. That's why they came here in the first place. Uh, and so I'm not going to change it. I, I mean, it's not for me, as, even if I sat on the city council for 25 years. I think the city is going to be pretty much like it is now because of the people want it that way. Um, another question? Uh, how are we doing on time? Well, it's 9 o'clock, so we've been going an hour and a half. Okay, should I make this the last question? And then we have to ask uh, Councilmember Smith about the uh, Lunch and Learn program. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Well, maybe we should do that first. Okay, so actually, so that's a tie-in actually to the role of the city in, um, in, in helping out residents. So explain a little bit about what you were saying about lunch and learn, and then we'll move on to our next question. Okay, so I, thank so you. I cut you off. All right. So this summer, I created a lunch and learn program. Uh, I hosted it at Essex House Apartment Buildings on Maple Avenue. Uh, the concept was that during the summer, those kids that receive free lunch or breakfast, only 20% of that population gets it during the summer. So there's this, there is a huge need. So I tried to figure out a way to solve that problem. So I worked with Montgomery County Public Schools to get the free lunch from them, uh, got residents of the apartment building to act as volunteers to uh, administer the lunch and learn. So there's 72, according to the landlord, there's 72 kids that live in the building. 65 of them uh, attended the Lunch and Learn program that was held Monday through Friday. Uh, it, it turns out that more kids wanted to, to read the books than those wanted to actually get the free lunch. So I worked with the library to continue to bring us new books so that the kids had, you know, more reading opportunities. We also got teenagers that lived in the building to act as kind of like mentors, tutors for the kids, you know, so that those kids could get their service hours. The idea for next term is to roll it out to more apartment buildings, not just in the Tacoma Park, but uh, throughout the county. Okay, great. And uh, actually, I think we'll probably be talking to you more about this later. So. Um, okay, before the last question, I have some announcements to make. Uh, I've been asked by Jesse Carpenter, the city clerk, to tell everybody that uh, what the early voting schedule is. It's going to run from October 30th to November 3rd. Wednesday through Friday, uh, it's from 2 to 8. Saturday, it's 10 to 4. Sunday, it's noon to 4. And you just go to this place, the Tacoma Park Community Center, 7500 Maple Avenue, and there will be signs directing you to a room. Uh, also, for those of you who are here, there are posters over on the side here that if you want to take them home and post them on your, uh, in your apartment building or someplace. There are also absentee ballots. Those of you at home can print out absentee ballots from the TV, uh, from the, um, the uh, website, the city's website. And, uh, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, our uh, young journalists, Emily Rainey and uh, Leela Sarkovic, who are here helping tonight. And... Um, so the question is, in the year 2025, will we be able to drive from through the junction without cursing the, the <laughs> traffic lights while we were sitting there waiting for them to turn or waiting for traffic to inch forward? Will we ever solve that, that traffic problem? It should be a problem because you shouldn't be able to buy gas by then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm back to make nice with the SHA. Uh, 
I, I think it will also, remember the rose-colored glasses? Mm. Okay. I think it will also be solved. Uh, uh, I know they're not going to move the building that's blocking, you know, because that's historically preserved. But I think it, it, it can be solved. Someone just has to sit down who's a traffic engineer and, and make it happen. Uh, so you're talking tra traffic circle? I don't think a traffic circle will solve the problem, but I've always thought, I didn't think, I mean, the traffic circle can only be about this big, not really, I mean, a little right. bit bigger than that, but I don't, I don't it, a traffic circle won't solve the problem. There's still going to have to be stoplights. Mm -hmm. I think if they would just move the stinking crosswalk and change the, it, it re, rebuild the bus bay so that it's ADA accessible or move the stop over to uh, in front of the Liberty Station, uh, I, I think all that could, could be uh, at least addressed. Uh, you know, at least try it. But uh, we have, I, I've, I've been saying all along, we have to make nice with the State Highway Administration and see if we can create a relationship and uh, see if we can talk them into maybe trying a couple of new things. Okay. I, I think we'll remove the worst of the encumbrances, the worst of the blockages, like Councilmember Daniels Cohen was saying, dealing with uh, the bus bay in particular. But I think given that intersection and the place that it is and the roads that come into it, uh, it's going to continue to be an issue for a long time until there are enough alternative modes of transportation that there aren't as many people in their cars commuting through Tacoma Park. Hmm. Any other comments on that? It's a fun little, a fun little uh, project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the nice SHA, yes. Okay. So it seems a shame to be wrapping up when uh, it becomes, I mean, more clear than even during a traditional um, forum that we are just barely scratching the surface of the concerns of the citizens. I and mean, we have so many questions we didn't get to. So. Uh, because of time, I think that we will be call, coming to a close. But I, um, between now and the election, we'll be doing our best to uh, get questions to you. Uh, we now see we see several issues that uh, uh, residents would like to see addressed. Um, we have a um, reporting staff who we will uh, be assigning uh, these uh, stories to, and so you should be fairly busy fielding questions from us over the next couple of weeks as we try to um, to get to as many of these as we can. Do you I, anything look forward, I will look forward to those. I, yes. It would be great to have these questions uh, because some of the questions you've asked tonight have forced us, I think, to think about our answers. It's just not, not glib answers. And so please send them along. Okay. And, and we will. And I'd, I'd like to make an offer to you. I'd be happy to work with you both to recreate this setting sometime in the next six months. Yeah. Come back to this, do this again with all of the council members with, uh, you know, advance notice to folks and have a conversation and have a forum and, and talk about issues about the future and where we need to go and what the problems are and how we can fix them. And when we do this again, we'll make sure that there's something under everybody's seat that they can take home with them. Okay. <laughs> because, you know.